Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I'm beginning the recording. My name is Hilda Kennedy, and I am president and founder of Ampac Business Capital. We are an SBA lender and a community development financial institution, and we're delighted that you have joined us for our first ever Black History Month webinar. Thank you so much for being here. As I shared a little bit earlier in setting up the ground rules, this session is being recorded and it will live on both our website and our Impact Business Capital YouTube channel because we know in the busyness of life, some people did not make it, but they really wanted to be here. And we know how many registrants we had for the webinar. So you will be able to get this webinar and see it again following the presentation. I also wanted to remind you that we're in webinar mode, which means that those who are participating and not on the panel are unable to uh, have their video shown or take themselves off of mute, but we definitely want to hear your questions. So at the bottom of your screen, we'd ask that you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. And the AMPAC team will be monitoring the Q&A and asking questions, asking those questions that you may pose. There's also a chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who use Zoom a lot, you know that you communicate via chat. But for this webinar, we're asking that you use the Q&A feature so that we can get those questions and record those questions. And any that we don't get to, we can get back to you uh, and answer those questions. So I wanted to start the conversation by telling you our why. Why this year? In AMPAC's history, where we were established in 2005 as a nonprofit organization, and we became an SBA 504 lender in 2007, we have never hosted a Black History Month webinar. So while some of our team members may have celebrated Black History Month to reflect on what Carter G. Woodson established in 1915 to celebrate the history and contributions of Black Americans, we did not celebrate or educate on this part of American history as a company. We've never done that. We know that the federal government did set aside this month in February to recognize the history of Black Americans in 1976 under President Gerald Ford. But why now, AMPAC? Well, the nation has shed a light on social justice that I have known and experienced in my family. But quite honestly, I have to admit that as a Black female leader, I have not leaned in on these issues as it relates to my business like this ever before. In fact, as a leader, and as the leader of a certified development company, a 504 lender, an SBA partner, I had not looked at the national numbers on this signature lending program of the US Small Business Administration or, um, or the organization as a whole. Of course, I knew that AMPAC numbers as it relates to SBA 504 lending for black owned or black led businesses was less than set stellar. And I knew how critical this capital was for wealth building in our company. I just never stopped to understand the why, why did and even though black owned businesses were growing by more than 30% year over year pre pandemic, why had not, why hadn't more black owned businesses taken advantage of this program? I had never stopped to ask why. And then as I started reading the reports about the wealth gap in our beloved country, it propelled me to look at solutions. 
when you Google how to build wealth, two areas come up on a recurring basis, entrepreneurship and real estate. And I began to look at our mission and said to myself, we do both. Why not better? Every report that I looked at on wealth building concluded that if we close the gap, the wealth gap, then the entire nation could benefit. In fact, a study by McKinsey released in 2020 noted that if the wealth gap between black and white families was closed, creating greater economic parity, then in 2028, the report noted, the national GDP would grow four to 6% in 2028. So why this year? Why does AMPAC do a Black History Month webinar this year? When I looked at this program that AMPAC administers, the SBA 504 program, our signature program in our loan offerings. And then I looked at the weekly lending reports of SBA, even as recent as last week, the number of 504 loans to black owned businesses was simply unacceptable to achieve the dual wealth building options for entrepreneurship and commercial real estate ownership. Across the nation, from 2017 to 2022, listen to these numbers. In 2017, 2% of all 504 loans in the country went to Black-owned business. In 2018, 1%. 2019, 1%. 2020, I'm sorry, 2019, 2%, 2020, 2021, and year to date, 2022, 1%, 1%, 2%. That is in direct contrast to the growth of businesses uh, in this targeted group of black owned businesses. So I did some research and I wrote a white paper after collecting this data and I shared it with policymakers and colleagues, including an impact investor. And I hypothesized the following. If we had a program to assist these targeted businesses with down payment assistance, then perhaps we could eliminate the barrier of entry to commercial real estate ownership. We found an impact investor and we launched this down payment liquidity replacement program to target women, black and Latino owned businesses this year. So why this year? Because we believe that this Black History Month, we can celebrate some entrepreneurs who are making great contributions in their field and who are helping our nation to get closer to economic parity through commercial real estate ownership and entrepreneurship. We're excited about the discussion that we'll have today. What we will do in this discussion is share the roadmap to commercial real estate ownership by celebrating the accomplishments of these black owned businesses who have laid some of the concrete to this uh, pathway to wealth creation. Our program today is called, It Is Possible. It's possible to become owners of commercial real estate for your business. It's possible for you to contribute to a more stable, national, gross domestic product because a rising tide floats all boats. We can achieve together. By achieving our possibilities, communities will be uplifted, families will be stronger because you are job makers.
and how do we get this done? Today, we'll talk about two vehicles. I'm gonna introduce you to Janine Warren. Janine Warren is AMPAC's Executive VP of Sales, Marketing and Business Development. And she's going to talk about this vehicle of the SBA 504 program that gets us closer to our destination and that you'll hear more from, from our customers who have actually used this tool. And then the second vehicle is this new product that we have introduced called the Down Payment Assistance Liquidity Replacement Program to support the equity injection or down payment to obtain an SBA 504 loan. AMPAC, with the support of our impact investor, will provide up to 50% of the minimum down payment to support business owners in getting started. So with that, I want to introduce Janine to just tell us a little bit more about this vehicle, how it works in the SBA 504 program, and then we'll introduce this amazing panel and the conversation that we have planned with them. Janine? Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I got to experience some technical difficulty, so I'm coming in by my phone. Okay. All right. Uh, Brian, do you have that PowerPoint? Yes, we do. Thank you. So um, what is the SBA 504 program? Um, it is a low down payment, the low market interest rate loan program providing financing for business owners to purchase, construct, improve, um, or refinance their real estate properties used and occupied by their businesses. Um, also, long life machinery and equipment can be financed. The program allows financing up to 90% of the purchase price, um, collateral value, or eligible pro um, project costs, allowing you to keep more funds in your pocket and um, with a small down payment of as little as 10%. Um, it is a public private partnership between a bank, the SBA, via a CDC or certified development company such as AMPAC, and the business owner. So again, as we mentioned before, you can go in with as little as 10%. Um, if you are a startup or the property would be a special purpose, which we'll discuss later on, there would be an additional um, borrower contribution to that. So the program also allows, if you do already have a building used for your business, you can refinance the building up to uh, your existing notes up to 90% of the real estate value, or if you're also including equipment, that can be refinanced. Um, and then if you want to take cash out, you're allowed to take cash out for up to 20% of the value of the collateral. The benefit to that right now um, a lot of these other programs that were available over the last couple of years, such as PPP and IDLE, oh, no, no longer exist, and you may still need um, some additional capital to be used for your operating expenses. So if you have some equity in your property, this uh, program would allow you to, to use that. Um, payroll expenses, utilities, inventory, so forth, can operating expenses. Um, there is no cap on the total eligible project amount for an SBA 504. However, the um, second trust deed, which is provided by the SBA, does have a cap of $5 million aggregate. And you can have more than one SBA loan, um, just you cannot exceed $5 million aggregate, unless there are special programs that allow you to have additional uh, financing and multiple second trust deeds under the SBA is if you are a manufacturer with all your manufacturing facilities in the US, or you use a green program. So you're purchasing a building and or you're remodeling a building and you um, put some solar panels on there. And if you can generate uh, more than 15% of your energy through a renewable source, you can have additional financing under the SBA. So, right? Next slide. Um, and so thank you. Oops. The other presentation, Brian. So 
So what are the benefits of using the SBA 504 program? Again, it's a low down payment to as little as 10%, which allows you to um, preserve your cash, to use in your business, to um, expand your business, to have these emergencies, so you don't have to put as much down. Typically, if you were to go with a bank um, on a conventional loan, you might have to put 20 to 50% in, depending on the type of property you're looking to finance. So this can allow you to be in with much less contribution to own your own property. Um, offers a fixed rate. Um, so we have 20, for really 10, 20, and 25-year fixed rate options, which are typically below market interest rates. Um, for example, right now, our 25-year fix for February is 3.59%, and that is fixed for 25 years. It's a really great rate. Um, all of the SBA administrative fees are financed within, within the loan, and you do not need to come out of pocket with that. So when you're looking at whether or not you want to take advantage of you want to look at your rent versus your ownership um, of property, um, pros and cons, and just count those costs over time and see if that would be a benefit for you. Uh, owning also provides you with legacy planning for your family. Um, and an exit strategy eventually when you want to retire from your business. Next slide. So here's a um, success story we have for a woman-owned business and um, psychologist. And she had been renting two different uh, office spaces to cover, two small offices. And she's facing rising rents on both, um, decided to go ahead and purchase a building and she was able to do that, consolidate the two um, locations. And um, even the, this all happened, her purchase closed right as the pandemic started. And she had to pivot over to um, virtual therapy sessions, as so many of us have had to learn to, to do new ways of business. But um, she gets to own her building, control her costs, and build wealth through that ownership. Slide, please. So um, again, the 504 program does seek to close wealth gap, and um, as Hilda will go into and will explain more on our down payment assistance program. I want to go a little bit into um, what type of businesses are eligible for the SBA 504 program. So the applicant business must be for-profit entity with primary um, operations located within the United States. Um, we work with a variety of business types and property types, so we can financing can be provided for the purchase. As I mentioned, also construction improvement or refinance of warehouses, manufacturing facilities, offices. Um, restaurants, retail stores, auto repair, storage facilities, um, gas stations, car washes, assisted living, wineries, just and more to that. So the, the requirement is that your business will occupy a minimum of 51% of the total square footage, but you can also rent out up to 49% for some additional rental income. Hopefully that will give you an opportunity. Maybe you can grow into the business. If we are doing ground up construction, the requirement is to be in 60% uh, with a goal to be at 80% within 10 years. Certain properties, as I mentioned, like a gas station or a car wash, assisted living, those would be considered those special purpose properties that would require an additional 5%. Um, additionally, if you are a startup business operating for um, less than two years, that would also, also require an additional 5%. Um, ownership of the business um, must be at least 51% owned by a US, U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident. And your business must not be engaged in gambling, speculative businesses, uh, multi-level marketing, anything of a purient or sexual nature, um, and definitely, definitely not engaged in anything to do with the sale or support, service, support services of the cannabis industry. This is a federal program, and we have to follow federal guideline, guidelines on that. So we are going to look at- Yeah, lots history. of questions on that, <laughs> that, that 
that question comes up a lot these days. So we definitely needed to mention that. Legal in California, but not on a federal basis. So, That's right. um, we, we will look at credit history and past behaviors of the owner. Um, but you know, just because something has happened in the past is eligible. We've definitely worked with a lot of borrowers who've had bankruptcies and foreclosures and life happens issues. Um, so what would make you ineligible to apply for an SBA loan would be um, if you previously defaulted on a government loan, federal government loan, that would make you ineligible if it's not been paid back in full. If you have open federal tax liens that are not on a payment plan, that would make you ineligible. And if you're currently on probation, you are not el eligible to apply. But um, I'm there. So you see a wide variety of programs um, are available or, you know, uh, different types and properties are available under the program. Um, keep in mind that when you go to your bank, they may say something is not eligible. And it might just be that it's not eligible at their bank. It doesn't mean it's not eligible for the SBA program. So that bank may not do startups, that bank may not do gas stations or car washes, but it still could be eligible. So um, if you're getting that from your bank, you can always come to AMPAC, find out, talk to us um, to see if it's an eligible program for that. Um, I would encourage you now, if you are thinking about purchasing a building, work with us to get a pre-approval. It's a very competitive market out there right now for commercial real estate. And having um, a pre-approval letter, knowing that we've looked at that and you can give that to your broker and to show to the seller that you're already working on your financing and you have lenders um, ready to provide the loan, that goes a really long way. And we're happy to do that for you. We just collect a few um, bits of information. So um, it's a great program to get started. And then, um, so Hilda's gonna tell us a little bit about um, our down payment assistance program. Great, right. thank you so much, Janine. We, uh, this running theme, it is possible. I hope that you're starting to get an understanding of that as we uh, celebrate some of the Trailblazers uh, and Black History Month. The Down Payment Assistance Program, as I was sharing earlier, it's designed to help a small business who is in this targeted group that I talked about earlier get assistance with the down payment. And the down payment assistance program provides up to 50% of that minimum down payment that uh, Janine talked about. The minimum down payment on a traditional 504 loan is 10%. If the business is a startup or special purpose, it could be 15% or 20%. The down payment assistance program will provide half of that up to $100,000 of that down payment. So ways that we might be able to help you with that may be doing the direct down payment or maybe liquidity replacement because of the funds that we've gotten from this impact investor. So we can share more and answer more questions on that. I really want you to hear from people who've made it possible or who have who have determined it's possible and have done it. And so I'm delighted to introduce you to this amazing panel of business owners who are in different parts of the state. And when you talk about your business um, panelists, tell us where you're located and uh, so that the audience can see the areas in which we've covered. We cover throughout the state of California. These businesses are in different areas in Southern California. Um, I'm going to introduce the sp first speaker only by name. I want her to give a brief description of herself, where the business is located and what she does. And then I'll call the next speaker in the next, and then we'll jump into the questions that we've talked about to, again, get to the point. It is possible. Anyone who's listening in, there is a question in the Q&A. We'll definitely get to that question. But let me start with Carla Thomas, Dr. Carla Thomas, who will introduce herself in her incredible dental practice. Dr. Thomas? Hi, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Dr. Carla Thomas and I own the Smile Studio. 
um, a dental practice in Inglewood, California, and we provide all phases of cosmetic implant, orthodontic, and general dentistry. Thank you very much. And then we have Duane Kano. Duane Kano is in the automotive sales industry. Duane, and take yourself off of mute. All right. Can you guys hear me? We can. All right. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure, Hilda. Um, I own uh, Innovation Auction House in the city of Hesperia, California, which is a an automotive auction house where we auction our vehicles. It's a huge um, black owned car dealership auction that was just opened up uh, about a year ago. Thank you. And then you have another location in Riverside. That's not part of what we did, but Absolutely. The locations. Absolutely, yeah. I have a location in Riverside. Um, that location is it's rented out. So, um, the, but you guys did help me on my loan on the location that I bought in Hesperia, and I have an actual um, in an escrow right now through you guys. Another location in the East Los Angeles area, which is an auto parts store. That that'll be that'll all all comes into the same play as to my auction house out in Hesperia. So it's a lot of great things happening for me from the. Um, through the impact team. Thank you. And then Kenya Blaine. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Kenya Blaine. I am a nurse entrepreneur. I am a registered nurse and I own Infusion Partners 360, which is a nurse registry. We subcontract um, CNAs, LVNs, um, and registered nurses for COVID testing, mobile COVID services, um, but our primary bread and butter is subcontracting registered nurses to provide infusion therapies to patients in the home setting. Wonderful. So um, my first question to the panelists, and we'll go in the order in which you introduced yourselves. Who inspired you to start a business? Part A is the question. And is your business part of a generational legacy or are you starting the legacy? Dr. Thomas. Okay, well, um, I think my initial inspiration was to become a dentist. And um, graduating from school, um, I started to practice and work for other dentists. During that time, I quickly picked up what I liked about their business, their practice, and what I disliked. And I knew the only way for me to practice and provide patient care the way I wanted to was to own my own business. So I think my circumstances inspired me to want to be a business owner just because I wanted to be the type of professional, the type of dentist that I thought was, you know, great. So um, that I would say that's what's inspired, inspired me. Now, as far as, um, you know, generational, <laughs> you know, I'm the first dentist in my family, the first business owner the first commercial property owner. So um, I had to plan and work hard, you know, to achieve the, the goals. I didn't have a parent who gave me a down payment or anything like that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, what about you, Duane? Um, who inspired you to start a business and is, is a, a being a business owner part of your generational legacy or are you starting it? I wish it was, um, unfortunately for uh, most of us and, and uh, primarily um, just Black America, um, it, it's not, that's not the situation. Um, what inspired me was my mom, you know, when I was uh, 16 years old, I, my first job was Albertsons back in groceries. You know, I, I worked there for about six months, my first job, and you know, I'm, you know, this is back in like the, uh, the, the late 90s, I'm 42 now, so. My first check was like two hundred dollars back then. Minimum wage was like six dollars and seventy-five cents. So, um, I was barely I barely had enough to buy a pair of shoes. So Jordans at the time I was a teenager. So I told myself, got to be something more to life than this. You know, um, uh, you know, we were born poor in Bronx, New York. You know, live with rat amongst rats and roach rats and roaches. Um, you know, so it's, you know, so the tools of of path that I took wasn't the necessarily always the right path, but I just known that 
there was something out there great and so i just kept he kept dwelling um just praying on it just kind of really trying to figure out that right path to where i can take to where i think you know i will become the best that i can there's not a class for that there's, there's no school for that you can go to school for certain things but it doesn't teach you the actual path way i mean everybody has their own path they make so um basically um, my mom inspired me i wanted to get her house so i ended up getting her house uh about about two years ago i was afraid when i first bought it so i can't afford this payment oh my gosh but after i got her that house that really built my confidence it really did then it was like all right let me secure my business now <laughs> so then i i wanted to get a business loan i didn't know how to do it but i know i had to, i know i had the basics good credit you know um uh you have to build you build have a business for a few years show and show success the numbers are great and that pretty much uh pushed me over that little edge to that ledge basically to be able to, to get that that loan and to be able to achieve those things that I thought was impossible. And and uh, a lot of it had to do with Deanne Pack and the team over there that actually helped me to, um, to get that first loan. And once you do that, it's, it, you're, it's like a snowball effect. You know, it's, you just got to break that mode, you know, and it, it definitely um, creates you as a person, me as a black male, and it, it defined and shaped me to who, where I am and, you know, the things that I, I do aspire to be in life. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your story. Kenya, what about you? Who inspired you to start a business? And is your business part of a generational legacy? You were, it was passed down to you or are you starting the legacy? Hi. Um, so I was inspired to start a business by one of my childhood friends. Um, her mom was a nurse and I always admired their family and her growing up. It was just something about, um, they just always seemed to have a good living and do fun things. And I was like, hmm. And then it was kind of matched by my paternal grandmother becoming sick um, and me becoming somewhat of a caretaker for her. So I gravitated towards nursing after deciding that becoming a doctor was going to take me entirely too long, <laughs> too much time. So I went into nursing and um, in fact, uh, I was working as a labor and delivery nurse in the hospital and my childhood mentor, who, like I said, had been a nurse for many years, asked me to start doing um, infusion therapy on the side. So I started doing that. And eventually we were a team of nurses who were very good at what we were doing. And with her years of experience, she asked me to become a part of her business. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, I was brought in very young in my early 20s, and I had no clue of what I was doing. So I went back to school to be, get my uh, master's in healthcare administration. And what inspired me to actually go into um, ownership of a property is because when I went to my accountant's office at the time, I was sharing with him how we were kind of operating from a home office and I didn't really have a space to run the business with a team. And he offered me a small space in his building. And I said, you could do that? And he said, yes, I could do that. Um, I own this business and I, or this building. And I was like, oh my God, you can own it. Like he was the first person who I, you know, uh, knew that had his own bu uh, building. So that's when the seed was planted. And um, so, Years down the line, I was able to work with the AMPAC team and um, acquire a commercial property. And this would be the start for my family. Um, this is not something that anyone in my family has ever done before. So this would be the start of a legacy. Beautiful. Thank you. I feel like crying hearing all of your stories because I can understand it. So um, my next question is, um, and Kenya, you kind of started on this, um, but why, why did you decide I'm going to purchase a building for my business? Um, there, were, there, there were various reasons um, along the way. First, just being inspired to want to do it. Um, and then I've always kind of had a little bit of a knack for real estate in general. So my initial reason was because I really didn't see, you know, that it being as a bad idea specifically. But as I began to surround myself with other business owners, um, I belong to a group, a peer 
uh, uh, CEO mentoring group. And I began to hear their stories as to why they have real estate. And I was even inspired even more, the tax advantages, um, the vehicles for retirement, to be able to sell your property and retire. Um, and to be able to have control of what you're doing um, in your building and not have to pay rent. When you start thinking about how much you pay rent to someone, which we had did for many years, and you kind of inquire on, well, how much would it cost me to own this building? It became an immediate no-brainer. Well, we could afford that and so on and so forth. So without going too deep into it, it's just kind of the reasons developed along the way and then it just didn't make any sense anymore it was just like yeah this is our goal this is what we're going to do and um, for the reasons mentioned above we unexpectedly pulled a trigger because at the time that we actually went for it we were actually just wondering if we qualified um, we wanted to make do that last little check to see what else did we need to do to be in position and come to find out we were already ready from the years of preparation. So um, yeah, that's that's how we got there. Good, good. Well, we're gonna talk about that preparation in just a moment. Um, Dwayne, so what was it? You're in Hesperia, what, what made you pull the trigger and say, I gotta do this now? Well, I was already successful from my Riverside location and I also own car dealerships in Ontario. So to me, it was, um, I was bringing a ton of traffic, a lot of work, advertising, working 20 hours a day, um, you know, just to get that far. So I was like, well, if I'm making over millions of dollars just doing this and I'm running out this property, how much more if I have my own location? There's a lot of things that I wanted to do at my Riverside location that I didn't want to, do. I didn't own the property. Um, certain things I want to do, upgrades, uh, which is very costly. You want to put 10, 20, 30, 40,000 hours into the building, improvements, modifications, making it look real good um, for somebody else. So why am I going to do it if I don't own the property? Because I'm on a lease at any point. If I leave a year or two years later, then that whoever owns this property reaps those benefits. So if you have your own property, if it's, you know it's your own, you're going to do more than if you're just running it out. And you're going to put a lot more effort into it. And at that point, you know, you're is your property for life. You can pass it down, kids, families, generational wealth type thing also. Also along with what um, the, the other lady said before I me, mean, um, as far as the uh, the benefits you get, the tax benefits, that actually it's a great advantage too. So all those things um, pretty much made me want to just jump forth towards this area. And it's, it's doing great. It's doing real great. And I'm glad that I, I was able to, to do that. But in the initial beginning, it, it's just knowing that if you can get, qual get qualified to do that, you know, um, just because you may be generating a certain amount of money doesn't mean, hey, you know what, I qualify to do that. No, just because you may have the best credit doesn't mean that. It's, it's a lot of things involved in that. But once you figure it out and with what you're getting the uh, weapons to succeed, you're getting a lot of the, uh, the help. It, it, it's a no brainer. It's pretty, it really is. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to talk about that preparation. So keep a put pin right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, you alluded to this, but get more in details, uh, Dr. Thomas. Why, why at that time, 10, 12 years ago, I can't even remember the exact date. Why did you say, right now, it's time? Um, well, at that time, I was leasing a space, and I had been in business for some years, and my practice was growing rapidly, and I knew that I had to move to a larger location. And... As I said before, I had this vision, like by that time I knew exactly how I wanted my practice to run. I, want, I knew the technologies that I wanted to provide for the patient. Um, I knew, I even knew, you know, what finishes I wanted on the countertops and the floors. And I, I knew I wanted this, you know, um, waterfall on the wall to greet the patients when they came in. And, you know, just as Dwayne said before, you don't want to invest that type of money into someone else's property. When you do the upgrades, when you do all the things um, that you want to have in your business, you want that to be some that to be an investment in yourself, not an investment into someone else's property. So I knew at that point, knowing that the next place that I moved to would be this practice of my dreams, that I needed to own the location. And thankfully, I mean, 
I bought my commercial property before Sci-Fi Stadium was, SoFi Stadium was built in Inglewood. So I have a tremendous amount of equity in my property. Yeah, yeah, pretty exciting, pretty exciting. So now I'm gonna ask you to get down to the nitty gritty. Somebody on the line, you know, all of you have said you don't come from generational wealth. All of you have said you're the first in your line to really own a business and take it to this kind of level. How did you prepare? I want you to describe your tribe, what you did personally to prepare to own your building from how you selected the person who helped you select your location. Who did you talk to? How did you prepare yourself financially? How did you know that you were financially ready? What did your credit look like when you started? Were there any barriers? And you don't have to remember all of those questions because I'm gonna just follow up with you as you ask, answer the question. But overall, the question is, how did you prepare? I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Thomas. Okay, so, um, you know, I think my preparation to buy a property started when I started practicing. You know, each month I paid myself, I put money away just, you know, to save for a bad business month, you know, any type of emergency fund that I needed, but. As my business grew, this fund became money toward purchasing the property. So I would say the first thing I did was just save money each month to have in the bank to um, be a uh, candidate or a, a person that a bank would consider you know, lending money to. Um, the second thing I think is really important is to keep your credit up. You should have you know, top tier credit. And even though you can get a loan without having that, but you will be offered the best terms, the best interest rates, you know, if your credit is good, you will, you know, lenders will want to work with you. Um, as far as finding the property, <laughs> I have sort of a funny story because I, I, the practice, the property where my practice is located um, was not for sale. <laughs> Um, it was a restaurant that had had a fire and the property had been sitting vacant for, you know, years as far as I can remember. And I would drive along this path to work and I would see this property, you know, every day and pass by and say, oh, that would be a great dental office. So I went to the county recorders and looked up to see who owned the property. And I wrote the gentleman a letter. I just told him, hey, I'm a dentist in the community and I saw your property. I see it's not being used. You know, do you think you would like to sell it? And so give me a call. So he finally called me and he said, you know, stop bothering me. I'm not gonna sell the property, you know, go away, don't call back. I said, okay. So I drove by a few more months and I said, you know, that's gonna be a great dental office. I'm gonna try this guy one more time. So I called him back. I said, hey, you know, it's me again. I'm sorry to bother you. I was just wondering, I see you're not doing anything with the property. If you would consider selling the property. No, I told you don't call me back. And I said, oh, okay, no problem. I won't bother you. A few weeks later, he called me. He said, you know what? I'll sell you the property. I said, okay. So I ended up getting that exact property with the perfect parking, everything that I had hoped for in my new practice was in this property. So I would say another, you know, if you see a property that you like, you never know, the owner might wanna sell it even though it's not listed. <laughs> try one more time. I like that. Just one more, try one more time. Great, Dwayne, what did you do? How did you prepare? Oh, I, did, I did the opposite of what a lot of my friends were doing. Um, and when I say the opposite of that, you know, I'm, I'm in the car business. So um, a lot of my friends in the car business, they have Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Bentleys and stuff. And um, I had a few too, 
but and watches and fancy stuff. But what I ended up doing was I ended up putting that money into the bank, liquidating everything I had, put it in, in into the bank because you can have good credit, but they also want to see that you have steady income in the bank for a certain amount of time also. And steady income meeting, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in there, especially for the property that I wanted to buy. So I my preparation was um, disciplining myself. I'm budget myself, whatever I'm making into the business. I'm not going to just blow it. I'm going to just literally just store it in the bank and my, they'll keep building my credit up because once you build that trust at that point, it, 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 it breaks down those, those barriers of, okay, we're not going to turn this guy down. He, he, he meets all the credentials that we want. So it was a lot of sacrifice, but uh, after about a year or two, um, it, it worked out and it just so happened that the effort that I put into it, it was my first property buying through MPAC was back in 2019. Uh, the deal was set, it was ready to go, everything was approved, everything was perfect, all the check marks and everything. I was so excited. We were buying a car dealership out in San Bernardino. I never forget this, never forget this. It was for $1.7 million. And at the last minute, the owner, at the last minute, he pulled out. I was so devastated because the uh, uh, appraisal, the uh, environmental, everything was like seven or eight thousand dollars. It cost me out of pocket. He pulled out. He just didn't want to sell it at the last minute. So um, I kept looking. I kept looking. You know, I like you know, like Dr. Thomas said. She, you know, you say they say no. You just keep you keep asking. You know, so I kept I kept looking for uh, other places. Finally, a few months down the road, I found my place out in the spur. Um, for one point three, it was like four, three hundred thousand thousand dollars cheaper. A much better deal, actually. <laughs> a greater opportunity. It actually worked out even better. Um, got a cheaper property, and uh, the uh, the patience that I took and the dedication and the hard work and it just just not giving up and just moving forward allowed me to to see that part of it, and it, it ended up working out for the best. That first deal was a it was a blessing in disguise. So that's pretty much what it was, and it definitely helped me to um it built me as a character and a as a person and to understand uh, the way business works. Not everything is going to always happen on your first try or the second. Or you got to keep going. And, but eventually, as long as you stay on that right path, you, you're going in the right direction, you know, and as long as you know you're doing that, it's going to happen. Awesome. Awesome. Kenya. Yes. Yeah, so, um, our road to getting the building was a long one <laughs> uh, for full transparency. Um, I had a bankruptcy and time had to lapse. Um, I had partners and we all had to get on one accord. Um, by the time I actually secured the building, um, I was coming out of a partnership so I only had, when, we, when I first started inquiring with Hilda, actually, um, there were three partners, um, but we uh, mutually went our separate ways. And um, at the time that we acquired the building that my partner and I are in now, um, we spent years of perfecting our credit, um, shaping our income to debt ratios, um, letting time tick to uh, let the bankruptcy drop off, um, saving money, being very conservative, um, just like Mr. Kano, like my business partner and I, we could do so much frivolous stuff with the income that we have, but we don't. We reinvest into other businesses and um, saving, and we're always coming up with something to do something else. So um, we were able to just take note, you know, almost trying to qualify to see what was needed. And we really did everything that we were asked to do along the way. I'm talking years. Um, and then by the time uh, my bankruptcy was falling off, I actually was pregnant. And there I was renting this space that was getting ready to go up on the rent. And I, the building was empty. I was pregnant. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going on maternity leave. I was you know, if it's meant for us, we're very spiritual and faith-based. If it's meant for us to look into this, by the time I get back, you know, we'll just check and see if it's available. 
I was pregnant, nine months, got married, went on maternity leave. I lost my father at the time. So that extended my leave. And by the time I came back, the property had been sitting for over a year. And instead of, you know, just paying the rent, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we literally walked across the street and said, hey, can we see in here? Because we have a vision in the future to do an infusion center, which we actually successfully opened. Um, and we want to bring our registry here too and kind of occupy the building. And so that's what I mentioned earlier. We just said, hey, this is an opportunity for us. We reached back out to Hilda. We said, we don't know if we're ready, but if we are, can you let us know? Because this is the vision that we have for the building. And lo and behold, we qualified. So um, truly a success. Um, the, bi the, the biggest um, just, we're so grateful because we've literally been able to move in and occupy the space for all of our businesses. We run three businesses out of here now, which that would not have even been feasible had we not purchased so to have total control over your space and to do the things that you want to do with your building has been um, truly a blessing. And so um, now we've outgrown the space and we need to come back and get another building <laughs> for other ventures. But, um, you know, that's our story and just taking copious notes and really listening to the advice that was given along the way is what allowed us to um, acquire the property. Really wonderful. I am telling you, your stories say to everyone who will hear this time and time again, it is possible. And we too are faith-based Kenya. And so we have on our wall in our building that we bought in November, 2020, um, Matthew 19, 26, with God, all things are possible. And we firmly believe that. And um, we know that for those who are on the call, we've gotten some great questions in the chat that our team and the Q&A that our team have answered. People leasing 18 years for Jonathan, leasing 18 years. Of course it's time and we'd be delighted to help you. And I know Janine answered that question. And to Nico Taylor, who asked about the beauty industry and do they qualify for 504 loans? Of course they do. And we'd certainly be able to um, be delighted to talk to you about that and talk to you about the possibilities. Uh, the reason we did this Black History Month webinar is because these business owners and others like them have done it. And you've heard their stories. One closed door does not mean no, it means it's on to get to your yes. If they sell the building from under you, if they tell you no three times, go back again, and then they call you. You know, you have a BK, you have something in your history, you're pregnant and you need to still close. We just closed a building with the down payment assistance program with uh, one of Janine's clients, she was pregnant. She was pregnant during the middle. She had the baby during the middle of escrow. <laughs> we extended oh. escrow so she can finish having the baby. And then we closed and we have a lovely picture of she and her husband and the baby because it is possible. There are no barriers for all of those of you who are listening there are no barriers that you should believe are too great for you to overcome, but you do have to prepare. All of these business owners talked about being prepared. They talked about saving. They talked about getting their credit house in order. And they talked about what I'm going to summarize is never, ever, never, ever, never, ever, Winston Churchill, never give up. You can do it, it's possible. You wanna get with the right partner. I have some colleagues in the CDC industry I see um, who are on the line as well. It, it doesn't have to be AMPAC, we'd love to serve you, but there are some incredible SBA lenders, incredible bankers, 
in this, in this industry who are equally passionate about this program, the SBA 504 program or other lending programs to make sure that you as a business owner and you as a black owned business can go from renting to commercial real estate ownership. The SBA 504 program is an incredible tool. We're excited about our down payment assistance liquidity replacement program. Um, but if we can't help you, we want to get you to the people who can. And uh, we have a number of partners in our, our Rolodex, if I age myself, to be able to help you. So I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. I wanna to thank you so much for uh, listening in so that you could hear these incredible stories. They're not super people, they're people with their own stories. And uh, that could be your, and you're gonna have your own story. But at the end of the day, conclude it's possible. It is possible. Uh, in the last one minute, do you have um, some parting comments? And I'll start with you, Dwayne. Anything you'd want to share with our listeners as we close? Mm -hmm. Taking yourself off of mute. <laughs> Dwayne is with us. He has his son, I think, has a game, but he was so kind to join us from the game to make sure you're still on mute, though. Yeah. come off now <laughs> um <clears throat> yes uh like hilda said for all you guys that are listening on it we're just regular people i mean there, there's nothing beyond that just with that extra hunger and desire and i think that we all can relate to that you know if you're ever in a situation where you feel that you need to do something it, you know you need to make a change um if there was ever a time in life the time time is now especially with a lot of the uh to help us as a community, as an organization, society, we're getting a lot more help than we were getting in the past. So don't don't think it's impossible. It's not it's not um it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, but it's it's not impossible. It is very possible. You just got to stay dedicated. Know that it is a sacrifice, and, and it is your life. But at the end of the day, you're building that generate generational wealth, and and that's that's something that, that your, your kids will grow into, your kids' kids will grow into. So you, you, you break that, that, that mold. Once you break that mold, it, it opens up a doorway of so much opportunity. It, and it's not hard to do it. You just gotta strategize and prepare and it will happen and it can happen to anybody it, and anybody can, can achieve. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Appreciate it so much, Kenya. I think um, my parting words would just be centered around not giving up. I mean, I, when I say years, it took for me to face rejection. And I was I had beautiful credit before a downward spiral in 2006 when the market crashed and things got crazy. So it's not like I was a negligent person with my credit. I was a victim of circumstances. But it's in the end, right after that happened, someone advised me that I should file for bankruptcy. And so I had to stick with that for 10 years. And um, even in the midst of having a great payment history and pretty, you know, pretty much the only thing on my credit was bankruptcy. It just, every time I had to hear the word no and just different things, it just kind of, you just have to keep going and keep planning and preparing. And so don't give up. Even if you have something you're facing that's stopping you, position yourself to overcome those things so that you can get your building. It's definitely rewarding to not have to ask anyone what you can do with your building. Thank you so much. And Dr. Thomas. Um, I'll just make it quick, you know, um, like the panelist says, I'm just a regular person who believed in myself. And you just have to trust your gut and know that you can do it. Drop the mic right there. You can do it. Not just Nike, you can do it. <laughs> and um, as a nonprofit mission-based lender, 
we are committed to your success. Our vision is to uplift communities, strengthen families, and advance entrepreneurial dreams. We're here to support you. We're here to provide resources. We have an entrepreneur ecosystem. We have a myriad of loan programs, not just the 504 loan program to help businesses get started and to scale, as well as purchase commercial real estate. So know that we're a resource. Thank you again so much for coming. You can reach us at ampac.com, A-M-P-A-C.com. Again, thank you. And we will look forward to serving you in the future. Thank you all panelists. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. And to our guests, I know there are a couple of questions, uh, comments in the panel. Uh, Ed Lewis, thank you, uh, who said he loves the panel and will reach out for support and talked about uh, purchasing land and developing manufactured homes. So we'd love to talk to you about that. And um, thank you for asking our resource partner, our, our clients, if they needed any support. And we will certainly share information as well. Again, thank you all for coming and we will look forward to serving you in the future. <laughs>